Last time, we trained a neural network to drive a car. Remarkably, using only images of the road and the corresponding steering angles recorded from human drivers, our neural network learned to steer. We then discovered that despite the speed and adaptability of this end-to-end -end approach, pretty much no one uses it in production, including the very inventor of the technology, Dean Pomerleau. But why? Why can't we teach artificial intelligence algorithms like deep neural networks to drive by learning from huge amounts of human driving data? Why can't we build a production grade self-driving car using end-to-end -end deep learning? Well, to get to the bottom of this, we first need some clarity on what exactly a production grade self-driving car is. One of the most compelling reasons to build a self-driving car in the first place is to save human lives. Over 1 million people die each year in car accidents, and road traffic injuries are the leading cause of death worldwide for people between the ages of 15 and 29. And since 94% of these accidents are linked to human error, if we can create an algorithm that drives more safely than a human, we should be able to reduce the number of automotive fatalities. Now, how do we know if our algorithm drives more safely than a human? One reasonable approach here is to let our algorithm drive on various roads and highways, using a human safety driver to take over if anything goes wrong. We can record the number of miles driven autonomously and the number of disengagements, where our human driver has to take over. We can then take this data and compare it to the performance of human drivers. For example, the number of injuries or fatalities that occur on average per mile of human driving. Note that for sake of illustration, we're showing a semi-autonomous system on a Tesla Model S, and not a fully autonomous vehicle. Since vehicle-to-driver handoff is part of the design of semi-autonomous systems, measuring disengagements here is less meaningful. We'll get into safety testing for semi-autonomous vehicles in a future video, and for now we'll focus on safety testing for fully autonomous vehicles. Now let's assume for a moment that testing goes very well, and our safety driver never has to intervene. Approximately how many perfectly driven miles do we need to accumulate before we can claim that our algorithm is statistically less likely to cause a fatal accident than a human driver? If you would like to venture a guess before we get into the numbers, here's a few multiple choice options. Let's compute the average performance of human drivers in the United States. According to the US Bureau of Transportation Statistics, in 2013, there were 32,719 crash-related fatalities and 2.3 million reported injuries. These numbers are, of course, way higher than we would like, but are actually tiny compared to the 3 trillion miles driven each year in the US. This makes for an average of 1.09 fatalities per 100 million miles of driving, meaning that the probability of a human driver causing a fatality in a given mile of driving is actually very, very low. 0.0000109%. So to show that our algorithm has a probability of causing a fatality lower than the human rate of one fatality per 100 million miles of driving, we have to drive a lot. Applying a few statistical assumptions here, to show to a 95% confidence level that our algorithm results in less fatalities than a human driver, we would have to drive 275 million flawless miles autonomously. This would require a fleet of 100 vehicles driving continuously for over 12 years. And of course, in practice, self-driving cars do not drive perfectly, meaning that we need to drive even more miles to empirically validate their safety. Now, what does all this mean for our end-to-end -end approach to self-driving cars? Wouldn't testing and validation be a problem regardless of the approach we used? Let's have a closer look at the two approaches to autonomous driving we've seen so far. The Autonomous Land Vehicle Color-Based Road Segmentation Approach and Dean Pomerleau's end-to-end -end neural network, Alvin. The ALV approach was entirely analytical. Engineers sat down, broke the overall problem into sub-problems, and built their own solutions to each piece. Solving the problem analytically like this creates some very real weaknesses. Engineers must make assumptions about what the solution will look like that may not hold up in practice. Solutions may not generalize well to new domains. Building these systems can be slow. And for many important computer vision problems, entirely analytical solutions may not even exist. Dean Pomerleau's end-to-end -end approach overcame many of these weaknesses. 
Alvin makes no explicit assumptions about what the road will look like, is fast to train, and NVIDIA's modern implementation generalizes very well across various domains. Empirical or database solutions like Alvin clearly offer many advantages over their analytical counterparts. Now, are there any trade-offs with an empirical approach? Do we give anything up when we choose to learn a solution from data? After training our neural network, we're left with a big collection of weights that remarkably allow us to map input images directly to steering angles. Now, what do we do if our big collection of weights makes a mistake? What if our self-driving car steers off the road? It may seem as if we can just open up our neural network, figure out where the problem is, and tweak a few parameters until our network outputs the results that we want. Unfortunately, we can't. The main difficulty here stems from exactly what makes deep neural networks powerful in the first place, representation learning. As we saw last time, Alvin remarkably learned lane marker detectors from data alone. Another way to think about this is that Alvin learned its own representation of the road. And with deeper networks like NVIDIA's, the learned representations are more complex. Earlier layers in the network learned simple features like edges and blobs, and later layers synthesize these features together into more complex representations. Now, while it's of course possible to visualize our weights, and even make more sophisticated visualizations that show things like which pixels in an image will most influence our output, we should be careful about assuming that we really understand how these networks work. In fact, if we go back and start changing our weights to create what we believe to be a better representation, we will almost certainly fail. We can say this with some confidence because the reason deep learning has been so successful is precisely because these models are better at learning representations than we humans are at designing them. For us, this means that by learning to steer our vehicle using end-to-end -end learning, we give up control over the pieces of our system. Today, there exists no meaningful way to break apart our neural network to test, debug, or tune it. End-to-end -end training means end-to-end -end debugging end-to-end -end validation, and end-to-end -end testing. By using a purely empirical approach to learn to steer, we built a system that is significantly more difficult to debug, validate, and test. Now, for many important problems, such as object detection and images, these trade-offs are well worth it. Problems can be isolated offline, and large datasets can be labeled and curated to achieve high performance. However, because we require such low failure rates for a complete autonomous driving system, as we've seen, the amount of driving data we need to even validate this performance end-to-end -end is untenable. Further, it may not even be possible to collect enough data to train an end-to-end -end system to sufficient performance. In his 2016 talk on sensing for autonomous cars, Amnon Shashua makes a strong probabilistic argument that the amount of data required to sufficiently train an end-to-end -end system grows exponentially with performance requirements. From this perspective, purely analytical approaches such as the ALV team's color-based segmentation method offer some key advantages. We can take apart, test, debug, and validate these systems piece by piece. Now, fortunately, we aren't required to use a purely analytical or purely empirical approach. The ALV approach and Alvin are really just two ends of a spectrum, and the really interesting solutions to autonomous driving live somewhere between these extremes, leveraging the strengths of both analytical and empirical techniques. Next time, we'll look at one such solution, the algorithm that Dean Pomelo and Todd Yoakum used to drive across the US back in 1995. The idea for this algorithm came to Dean in a flash of insight while driving in the snow one evening in Colorado. According to Todd, this insight was enough to make Dean immediately junk Alvin and start over. Next time, we'll dig into Dean's new approach. Thanks for watching. Want early access to the next Welch Labs video? Consider backing Welch Labs on Patreon for early access to upcoming videos and other fun perks. For more information on safety and reliability testing in autonomous driving, I highly recommend the research report Driving to Safety by Niti Kalra and Susan Paddock. If you would like to learn more about end-to-end -end deep learning or behavioral cloning for autonomous driving, I highly recommend Dean's original publications and the end-to-end -end papers from the NVIDIA team. Also, Waymo recently published a very interesting approach that's not quite end-to-end -end learning, 
but does effectively use machine learning to learn driving behaviors. 